Joey Essex was on Love Island. I'm just trying to explain to him so that, yes. I'm confused by I know, life. I know. He was a bombshell. What? I yes. don't even know what that means. It, yeah, well, I'll explain to you. Thanks. Yeah, Welcome you back. <laughs> um, she's like, what? <laughs> Good change. <laughs> she is one of the most powerful women in Britain after the Labour's landslide victory in the general election. Uh, Angela Rayner is a new appointed uh, deputy PM. And less than a month on, she's already making big changes, including yesterday's announcement that new rules will be put in place to boost the number of affordable homes in the UK. And she's joining us now. Um, morning. Morning, morning, you. Good morning. morning. Um, obviously, we need to start on a not-so-nice note at all by acknowledging the horrific events that occurred in Southport earlier this week. We've been covering it a lot, and it's just heartbreaking. Yeah, it's... It's horrific, and I think the whole nation are shocked mm -hmm. because of the violence against young children. Yeah. My granddaughter's six, and they that were age, right? at a concert, and the heroic efforts of the adults that were there trying to care for mm -hmm. the young people and the way the community came and the emergency services that were there to just try and help. And to see that level of violence, it's sickening. Yeah. Most people can't comprehend why. And, of, and the community are asking what, why, and we have to let the police do their job now. Mm -hmm. And what's horrifying for me as well is people from outside Southport, when the community had a vigil last night, went to Southport to create violence on the streets. And well, it's just so it's disrespectful just... to that community. Yeah. It's, it's... You know, it's getting in the way of their grief. It's, it's you know, you, you, you've got to let that... You have to let that respect that mm -hmm. community's wishes and let them grieve. You know? mm -hmm. It really is, and the police and the first responders that were there on the scene after the horrific incident were there last night having to keep order when we had fuggery and violence. 39 police officers injured. It's just disgraceful. Yeah. It's not the mm. way we do things in our country. And I understand, obviously, that it is legal and, you know, that's why... I'm assuming that's why that we don't obviously get to know much about the perpetrator, but... In those instances, when you see what happened last night, do you think it would help to know more? Because obviously there's different stories and lots of mistruths that we've, you know, now since heard. But then we saw last night and it's just... I mean, it's madness. Yeah, I think there's been a couple of instances recently where, especially particularly online, where theories and things are whipped up, whereas actually it turns out to be not yeah. true or not mm. the full picture. And I think... There's a culture now where people want to instantly get the facts, but actually it's important that police and those people that are doing the work are able to carry out mm -hmm. that work. And mm -hmm. it's important for justice as well, because we have law and order in the UK, and it's important that those authorities are able to establish the facts and then to be able to bring those forward. But speculation and some of the uh, facts, uh, the untruths that have been put around social media is... Not only is that creating tensions and fear in the community, but it's disrespectful to family who maybe want those answers that haven't got those mm. answers. And they're still it's establishing unhelpful. that. It's not helpful for anyone in those circumstances. And I guess it's unhelpful for the police as well. It's really unhelpful for the police and, and for justice to take, it, take its, its, its part, really. Yeah. And, and my plea is that we all need to step back and just wait, and then that information will come, yeah. but allow the police to do their work, allow the authorities to do their work. And keep in mind the victims, the families and the people that are at the heart of the trauma yeah. of what that, happened yeah, in that's, these that's what it is, respecting the families that dropped their little ones to a dance class and, you know, expected them to yeah, have a lovely yeah. day over the summer and the tragedy that they're now going through, you know. Um, Angela, let's move on. It's a month since the general election. Uh, were you... How hard is it from the day one when you, when you hit... I mean, it's obviously what you've been waiting for. You've been, you've been, you know, you can't wait to get cracking. But does the workload... Do you, does it just, like, go zoom and you're like, right, we're in. That's it. Goodbye to my old life. This is it now. I, yeah. You know, like you said, they go to sleep with the red box. Yeah, I, I, I did fall asleep on the red box. <laughs> <laughs> the other night I was telling you in the break... That's but... a right of passage for any <laughs> politician, right isn't passage, it? Yeah, I mean, it's just eat, sleep, work, repeat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, at the moment, but you, you mentioned it before, you know, I've been in opposition since I was elected in 2015, and the frustration is not being able to affect change. So now, and I think maybe the chip on the shoulder of my background as well is, like, I'm, I'm impatient yeah. to yeah. make that change and to prove to people 
that we can do things differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the frustration is people don't think politics can make a difference mm -hmm. to them at the moment. And I'm determined to prove them wrong. Yes, it's not perfect and we all get frustrated at times, but there is a lot more we can do to fix what's happening in the country at the moment. And how long do you reckon... OK, let's take housing as an example. It's obviously a long-term thing. So how long do you think before the decisions you make, people can see a tangible change in, in what this you want? This is what I wonder. You know, because everyone's so short-term now. Yeah. So and the tone is very, as you said, isn't it? How is it going to make a difference? What's going to happen? How, when, when, when do you see that? Yeah, and that's the challenge on some policies, like the New Deal for Working People can be enacted, some of it very quickly, uh -huh. which will have an immediate effect on jobs. But things like Great British Energy or on housing, as you say, in my area, you pull a lever and it's some years down the line yeah. because, mm -hmm. you know, it has to go through planning, which is why I was eager to get the planning reforms through so that we can get more affordable homes built and we can get the houses that people desperately need because we've got a homeless and housing crisis yep. in the UK. But that won't happen overnight. So the New Towns proposal, which is why I've come out with it today, again, is the New Towns Task Force. It'll take them hopefully before a year, but up to 12 months for them to look at what sites are available. And then we have to go mm -hmm. through the planning process to then get that up and running. There are things we've done immediately. We've called in some sites. We've given onshore wind the go ahead. Mm -hmm. So there's things that we've done on stalled sites, for example, so we can get things moving. But housing does take longer than, than what some other policies that we've done mm -hmm. immediately, like we've got rid of the Rwanda policy because it's a gimmick and it wouldn't work. So we can redirect those resources into something that will work to, to reduce the, the problems that we see on our border with the gangs that are smuggling people across on those small boats. It's such a... Not a controversial thing, housing, because everyone knows we need more houses. But I suppose it's where they get built. Like, I, I like to think I'm no NIMBY, but maybe I would be if it was being mm. built, like, in a lovely field next to me. And no-one wants to be building on greenfield land. But how do you go about, kind of reconciling that? How do you go about the middle ground? There's a lot of brownfield sites, a lot of those what they call grey area sites, yeah. aren't there, that you need to focus on first, I suppose? I think the first thing is that the, the reason why I've said local plans have to be for every local authority, and at the moment we've only got about 30 that have got up-to-date local plans, means they have to consult. They have to identify what the housing need is yeah. under our formula, and then they have to consult with local people and then when you've got the plans, it's about making sure the infrastructure is right. So the planning is a crucial bit of getting the infrastructure. And right, because it's all about the hospitals and schools. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of the time people genuinely... Yet there isn't a family that hasn't got a housing need that isn't met in the yeah. UK at the moment. So people are not, like, NIMBY for NIMBY reasons. They're saying, well, hang on a minute, our roads are already congested, mm. we can't get a GP appointment, and now you want to build more houses here. So infrastructure is critical, and that's why our rules will make sure that we get that infrastructure as well, because I've heard what people have said on that. We need these homes. Mm -hmm. But, Ange, we need the infrastructure in place yeah. as well. You can't just land us with 900 new homes without a new GP or a new school, and that's why... And without outside focused space and greenery. Outside well. space, mm -hmm. protecting nature, which is all part of the rules that we've put forward. In terms of, you know, we do phone-ins on this show a lot, don't we, Dan? Yeah. And in terms of people being able to afford to pay their bills, I've done calls where people are choosing whether to heat their house or and so on and so forth. Obviously, the winter fuel payments mm. being axed. What sort of toll do you think it's going to take on those people? I mean, the frustration is what we inherited. It was horrendous when the Chancellor looked at the books and even in my own department, things that were not funded, that were really critical uh, pieces of work that we were doing, but totally unfunded. So there's a real gap there. So there were some really difficult choices. And what the Chancellor set out with the winter fill payments was about people on pension credit. Now, there's, there's thousands of people that are eligible for pension credit that are not currently receiving it. So my plea to people who are listening to this is check out whether you're available for pension credit because there's so many people that won't and those people will continue to get the winter fuel payment. It's the hinterland that's the worry isn't yes. it? Yes. The people that just fall around it. Rather just than... hit just hit that bracket. Yeah and that's why we've put growth central as well because we've got to pay for our public services bring people's bills down so great British energy and the work we're doing there will eventually mean that we'll have our own energy efficiency security so we're not at the mercy of dictators like Putin. So, if people are watching this, what would you say, just in a couple of sentences, sum up what Great British Energy would be? It's a publicly owned body 
that will work within the private sector to deliver renewable energy so that we're self-sufficient, so we're not at the mercy of dictators like Putin, bring energy bills down and give us the jobs that we need for the future. And how long do you reckon people would... Like, what, what do you, how, long, how long do you need to put that in place before people see those bills? Again, in? some of it could happen quite quickly because we've already indicated to the market renewables that we're doing it. We've already yeah. created a wealth fund. So some of that, these businesses that are already up and running that say, hey, because the other government wasn't interested in it. So some of that can be done relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Some of the bigger infrastructure will take us a bit longer. But you'll have seen in the last four weeks, we've already laid down the legislation for Great British Energy. We're already doing the work that's needed, but it will take time for us to be able to set up the company and for us to take the, that issue forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are things in the meantime that we can do. We've already talked about onshore wind and making sure that we've already approved a solar farm. So we're already doing things now that will start to have an impact early doors as well. Let's talk about you for a minute shall we? Because I think you, you, you interest so many people. It's so nice to see a powerful woman at play. Your personal path into politics surprises a lot of people, doesn't mm. it? Yeah, I never... My career's advice was not, you're going to be a politician, or... I, I was never <laughs> you didn't want to be a politician. I didn't. I, I never thought I would be a politician. I don't come from a political family. You know, I didn't work for an MP. <laughs> like you ended so, up being a union rep, but by, almost by accident or something. Totally by accident, because I went into... I, first of all, I worked in the private sector as a care worker. Yeah. And that was really rubbish, and they paid the staff horrible. And then they said, oh, go and work for the council. They look after you and pay you better. And I was like, OK, so... I worked for the council and then somebody said, oh, I was, I was moaning because he wanted to privatise us. And I said, I've just worked there, it's terrible, this <laughs> is so much better, quality care. And someone said, you should be our union rep. And I'm like, what's a trade union? And then that was it, you know, it took off and I got involved in understanding that some of the decisions that were being made, like, for example, management would say, we'll have a 15-minute call. We're like, I can't get... I don't know anyone who can get up in the morning in 15 minutes, let alone someone who's elderly or vulnerable. So I was like, this is a crazy po uh, policy. So I got involved in the mechanisms of how to change things right. and then it escalated See, from I think there. Irrespective of politics, you're, you know, someone like you is a blueprint for how people should get involved in politics. Yeah. So what advice would you give someone who's out there that kind of wants to be engaged, but it, does, it feels like there's a disconnect there? Yeah, and it's the same, it's the same advice that, I'd give to, that I've given to my children, is find something that interests you and then go along with, in, in whatever way. So if, whether it's a community group, whether it's a particular project, you know, people get involved. Some of the most amazing people that have done amazing things, whether in the community and voluntary sector or in politics, have accidentally got involved because it's something they like. Mm. So if it's something you want to pursue because you enjoy it, Your then, then you'll, you'll, you'll rise with it. You'll, you'll be able to really enjoy what you're doing and really have some good results. And I think too often, you know, I, when I was in the shadow education brief, you know, the families were, the kids were pushed, you need to be a doctor, you need to be this, you need to be that, you know, you need to be a lawyer. Well, I've met lots of miserable people in jobs that they <laughs> never wanted to do, but they felt that was yeah. where they should yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you should lean into what you enjoy doing. And then you, it's like me, I enjoy my job, so I, I wake up in the morning, go to work, I yeah. go home at night and I go, I, I, after work and I go to bed. What but are you doing I, today? Every day. With my red box. But every day, it's not work, because I enjoy what I do. Yeah. What are you so, doing today? What am I doing today? Well, I'm doing media. I was with the Prime Minister earlier this morning. Breakers. And, well, and then I'm meeting the him. mayors, the Metro mayors. Did you sit later. down and have a nice breakfast yeah. with you? No, he didn't, he didn't give me any breakfast. What? No breakfast. Most important meal of Pull your day. finger out, Starmer. To, to be honest... Tell me, we gave you... We scrambled eggs for the debt PM. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Fleur downstairs can do you some toast or something. I'm not very good, good at eating before 8am, if okay. I'm honest. But breakfast is the most important meal of the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go. Still 10.49, you've got time. <laughs> Thanks, Angela. Thank, thank you. Good thank to have you with us. Thank you so much for visiting our This Morning YouTube channel. We upload new content every single day so go ahead and hit that subscribe button and we'll see you in the morning.